All right. Welcome, everybody, to The Daily Objective. I'm your temporary daily host for today with my co-host, Anne Chekalala, and we're going to be talking about Ayn Rand and Shakespeare and tragedy and comedy. Um, but before we get into everything, I thought because we're not regulars on the show, um, Anne and I could introduce ourselves. My name is, like I said, Kirk Barbera. I am the editor-in-chief and creator of the Troubadour magazine, and Anne Chikalala is the artistic director of Austin Shakespeare. And, you know, because we're going to be talking about Shakespeare and Ayn Rand a little bit, and if we could start real quick, you have something coming up in, uh, like what, November, I believe, which is relevant to what we're talking about. And why don't you tell us what that is really quickly? Can you hear me? Uh oh. I'm getting a delay. I don't know if it's because you have YouTube on or whatever. Oh, okay. But I'm, You're hearing a I'm delay. I'm getting a delay. Okay. So I don't have YouTube on right now. Can okay. you hear me now? I'm still, I'm hearing all that you just said. Oh, okay. Through, this is through Zoom now? Yeah, it's through Zoom. Oh, interesting. So now, now are we on track? Are we better? Now we're on track, but yeah. Okay. So now cool. we're good. Okay. So, I, you know, Sorry for the hiccup. That's um, okay. I do not have YouTube open. Dylan has asked me if I have YouTube open. I'm still getting a delay. Okay. So I don't know why I'm getting... Yes, you don't have YouTube open or you do? I don't uh, either. Dylan, yeah. can you help us? So that's interesting. Why a delay? So if you perhaps check your Zoom preferences, is there anything in there of your audio or speaking? I'm not sure. Dylan. Uh, so Mary Aline, thank you for the $2. And sorry, guys, for the technical um, delay here. Not sure exactly what's happening. I think with... I do. Okay. I think you it do? was me. Okay. So, it was me. Yeah. So are we good now, though? Yes, we're good now. Okay. Everybody, thank you for your patience with us <laughs> as we, uh, you know, we're not the regular house. So we had our, you know, our hiccup of the day. And our now gaff. we're on track, our gaff. There we go. Yeah, so we are. But I had no uh, idea. Yeah. I don't know why it came up. Yeah. <laughs> we were in Thank the you. darkness like Malvolio in the pits. <laughs> um, so well, it is true. We are doing Twelfth Night here in Austin. And as you know, Austin has become the magnet for mm -hmm. many, many objectivists. Yeah. And Kirk has been putting together some social activities for them, including bringing them to a football game. Yeah, and we're doing YouTube. We'll go, we're uh, going uh, to uh, hopefully Twelfth Night. So thank you for that. Definitely Twelfth Night, Marriage of Figaro. We have a lot of events. So if you need any reasons to move to Austin, this is a good reason to move to Austin. There's a lot of stuff coming up and including um, a rendition of Austin Shakespeare's, uh, Austin Shakespeare's rendition of uh, Twelfth Night, which is going to be a Bollywood production, which sounds really interesting. I've never seen Bollywood. I mean, I know of the kind of, over the top tropes. Um, and we could talk a little bit about comedy and tragedy, but one of the things that comes up with Ayn Rand, and actually before I get in this, um, I want, want to remember to, to mention, if you're not an ARUCK member, it's only $10 or 10 pounds a month, and you get a lot of great values, including um, you get to be participate in Don Watkins' boot camp, writing boot camp which is worth a lot of money, actually. And you can actually see how much he charges for it. So it's a very high value. I really recommend it. And there's a lot of other values that you get from ARUK. So I recommend you know, joining. And it's only, at a minimum, it starts at 10 pounds a month. And there's other things, of course, to pay for. And it allows these types of projects to occur. Cool. Well, thank you. Marilene uh, has given us a couple of bucks. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I you, was Mary. just telling Kirk that there are some T-shirts online. I got the ARUK T-shirt, but there is a Nikos T-shirt. Yeah, that's what you guys are Kirk saying. Kirk is going to explore. <laughs> well, I thought since we were doing Twelfth Night, yeah. and I knew that Leonard Peikoff in his Great Plays book talked about how he really doesn't like the comic characters and he skips them and so on, that it would give us a provocation to talk about Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. And what she said and thought about Shakespeare, what we agree with or don't agree with or, or whatever. So thank you, Kirk, for being willing to, willing to dive in and, and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting topic. So Ayn Rand in the gener generally what you read out there of the Romantic Manifesto, 
the art of fiction, her letters. She doesn't write that much about Shakespeare except to say that he's a naturalist. I think, you know, there's um there's an interesting context in her work where she is doing this broad philosophical dis- dis- dissection of a lot of art. And, you know, I don't think she's necessarily saying don't read or watch or see Shakespeare. Now, the in eight great plays, as you mentioned, Leonard Peikoff famously picked out eight great plays over the history of theater. It's a lot of plays, a lot of theater. Um, and, you know, he's saying that these are the best philosophically and theatrically. So he both were essential in his selection process, right? And Othello, he chose as the Shakespeare or the greatest of that era uh, specifically. But like you said, he was not a huge fan of the romantic or the comedic characters. Now, so this is a good opportunity for us, you know, like how do you approach that? If let's say you're not a, you know, you're not a regular reader of, Shakespeare or literature, classics in general, how do you approach that kind of thing? You have somebody you really respect who says, not a big fan. And so maybe you won't even try to go watch this play that's coming up. And you say, ah, I could skip that. Wait for something more serious. And Anne, I'm just curious what you think about, you know, how, how do you approach those kinds of issues, especially if you, you know, really respect Leonard Peikoff, which I oh, do. Man. I think we all and do. that book is fab. I mean, one of the main things we should get across today is uh, if you've not read the great plays as literature and philosophy, read it. It's just phenomenal. And he yeah. does Othello is the, is the play that the he play. focuses on and really philosophically on Iago as the hatred of the good for being good. So uh, it's really interesting. But uh, Peacock himself will say, you know, I'm not into the clowns or the low characters. <laughs> But mm. the truth is the romantic comedies, plays like Twelfth Night, and many people know much ado about nothing. I mean, mm-hmm. there is a consummate film with Kenneth Branagh that's now like 25 years old, right? Yep. Emma Thompson Very is good. even better than he is in it, but he, he made it. <laughs> that's one thing I would say to answer your question, Kirk, is I think it's perfectly fine to get on YouTube and watch the movie. And you know, even just famous scenes from a movie in Shakespeare, I think helped tremendously. And some people can look at the script as they're, you know, sort of reading along. But I think just watching it is fun. Now, you said, Kirk, that you actually saw some Twelfth Night video. What did you see? Well, OK, so I watched adap- adaptations of it. So I watched um, one of the guys, a 1985 movie. And I watched a movie that I liked as a younger person um, because I had a crush on Amanda Bynes. I watched She's the Man uh, or rewatched that again. And yeah, so it's. So one, so, so there's a lot of ad- adoptions out there, adaptations, um, not just of this play, but of other plays. And then there's actual productions that you can go find, which I have not watched. And this was actually my first time reading this script um, of Twelfth Night. I actually have not read as much of the comedies, perhaps because when I was exploring Shakespeare 10, 12 years ago or whatever, I started it through Peacock and I may have not wanted to, you know, I I read a little bit more of the histories, a little bit more of the tragedies and didn't really spend too much time with the comedies. Now, by the way, I think that's fine, but I want to make one quick argument of um, something that Ayn Rand said. Now, by the way, this is not to at all say that I think Peacock is incorrect in any way. It's to, in, in, in terms of his personal evaluation of this, but, you know, the, the point of for me, exploring literature is the exploration and the pleasure you can get out of it. But sometimes you may read, even study and try to understand something like Shakespeare, which requires a little bit of study sometimes. And you don't, you don't like it. You end up not, you know, if you think about it, you're like, yeah, I don't actually like that that much. And that's okay. That's part of it. Just like you see a movie and you walk out and you're like, ah, I don't like that as much. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. I think. Well, that let me is, let me interject, Kirk, uh, because Peacock's I think perfect. some people watched Peacock on Operetta, mm, and it's similar recently, yeah. in the sense that it's a new thing. Yeah. It's not in our vocabulary. We're going to like some parts of it, not like other parts of it. But if we explore it further, we might find some value there. So I'll just throw that in. No, I think that's a really good point. Like, so I do something called the Literary Canon Club. And the goal of it is to help people approach classics that they might be afraid of. 
And that, but they've always kind of thought about reading, right? So a lot of people say these things are great, say they're classics, but how do you know if they're great or not, if you don't read it for yourself? And it's the same thing with Shakespeare. So we know Leonard Peikoff's evaluation, his personal view of it. And maybe there's some, you know, maybe you'll have a similar approach, but maybe you will appreciate and enjoy or gain a little bit of pleasure from it. So I actually gain a little bit of pleasure. Uh, although Twelfth Night wasn't, I think I probably, it's been a long time, but um, I mean, I definitely love Romeo and Juliet and always have a very strong reaction to that. And um, this one, I did have a bit of a reaction, but not as much. Although I did like She's the Man because I think I had a crush on Amanda Bynes. But, uh, but I think there's something like very interesting about the play that's worth visiting. And I'll just make, so one thing that Ayn Rand said, and this is in her um, Ayn Rand answers, that I think is one uh, argument that I use for people and why they should try to occasionally throw in a classic, right? And I'll, I'll give a little tip on how you can do that without making it overwhelming your life. Like I'm a, you know, I'm a literary person. It's as my profession, you know, and as well. So we're probably going to read more than you. So how, if, unless you're like us, so how does somebody who's, you know, just trying to get in a little bit of it, you know, explores. Well, Ayn Rand said that the purpose of all art is the objectification of values. That's just like the purpose of it. The reason it exists, you know, uh, and a person's response to a work of art will have a lot to do with his attitude toward human values. But the first step is that what art is, is an objectification of values. So when you're looking at Shakespeare in this time, you're seeing values, some universal that may be resonant today because we're, we're very Shakespearean in some certain respects, whether we realize it or not. Um, and some of them may be very different than our own time. And that's actually a very deep value for why you should explore a Shakespearean work or other classics, because you can see the, how they objectified, you know, values right or wrong, doesn't matter, but you can kind of evaluate that. And that to me is a very empowering tool for even getting outside of your own values and evaluating your own values on an internal level. So that's one yeah, reason. And, you know, a lot of those characters, even in the comedies are really heroic. They may get messed up. They may end in tragedy or, uh, you know, the comedies, the, the criteria for a comedy is it ends in marriage. That's mm. really what a comedy is in Shakespeare. All the comedies end in marriage. Yeah. So I see Jonathan Honig gave us two ninety nine. Thank you, Jonathan. And, you know, I uh, hope that the Chicago Shakespeare there on the pier is back. And I know Jonathan is in Chicago mm. So he has lots of great theater and maybe he can go see some, some Shakespeare. But um, I think if you look at the Peacock chapter on Othello, as you come to the end of it, he has many positive things to say about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. What is negative about Shakespeare is this idea that people are fated. He uses mm. the idea of a tragic flaw that Othello yeah. is jealous to this degree that destroys his life and, uh, the world around him. And uh, Peacock doesn't really see a motivation for that. He doesn't see what Iago does as enough to make uh, a trigger Othello into this mad uh, attack on Desdemona. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a good point is that there is a lot of values in it, even if overall you may come away and say, I don't like the tragedies because I don't agree with his, you know, his values that Shakespeare is doing. I think famously... Um, well, I mean, all of his plays were super famous, but, you know, in Romeo and Juliet, uh, you know, it starts off with like this, you know, star-crossed lovers that are doomed to fail from like the prelude, like right when you have that first character come out to talk to the audience, he's saying you have these star-crossed lovers and they're going to die, basically he tells you right at the beginning. And, you know, in the plot of the story, the only reason that it actually, that Romeo doesn't get it is from some small like slip up of the messenger that basically he like trips and doesn't get there in time and that's it and that's the reason they both die. actually and it's like, kirk yeah, there's a words. plague and the and the friar the messenger the other the friar, friar, friar john yeah. is quarantined that's what it is yeah yeah that's why he doesn't He's he doesn't get it so he, he doesn't I've try to been break studying the uh, lope <laughs> de vega who is a spanish playwright of the spanish mm. golden age and he has a romeo and juliet he got the same story didn't know shakespeare was writing one Huh. And it's a comedy. 
because it ends in marriage because the friar makes it. Yeah. Well, so this, that's a good point of like, you know, what she, one of the things that I think Shakespeare does is so he takes, so a lot of you, you may not realize this about Shakespeare, but Shakespeare basically isn't a very inventive plot creator necessarily. He gets all of his plots from histories, from mythology, from books, you know, other people from before him. But when, and sometimes he'll include some little unique subplots, but basically the plot is very not original, not very original, right? And this is something that Ayn Rand said is basically naturalism, right? Is plotlessness. Now it's not to say he has no plots, but again, he's not doing too much with them. It's more about what the characters are doing in those moments and their, you know, reactions to it. So in um, what is it, Measure for Measure, that story is an extremely normal it's a classified as a comedy although it's because it ends in marriage even because it ends in marriage she doesn't speak she yeah. makes her marry him and she says nothing yeah exactly and it's a very bizarre comedy though and it's and you know in it's, our, a dark, like, it's a dark it's a dark comedy would be a good way of putting it but the plot you know is something that we all if you're an objectivist you might recognize something similar to it by the way which is a powerful man um, has the the fate of another man under you know a, a, the life of another man under his toe, and the beautiful sister in that case is supposed to marry the powerful or is uh, you know to sleep with the powerful man essentially. That's the kind of trope that's been around since you know Greek mythology. You have those types of stories, and Shakespeare doesn't really do much with that except to say one thing about which I, is an important change. But he takes that plot. And just has the, the sister say, no, I'm going to keep my chastity. And that's basically, you know, the, the, the struggle of the play. Right. And so, you, have like a, you know, to state the obvious, I'm glad you brought up measure for measure. The language, the poetry yeah. is out of this world. And they do yeah. dig deeply into the problems of lust. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic play. Yeah, no, I, it's been a long time since I read it, but I remember that one. I definitely enjoyed a lot. Uh, because of the poetry and the same thing with Twelfth Night. So that brings to another aspect of, you know, the love of Shakespeare and why I think so many people do love him, even though a lot of his plots are pretty trite. A lot of times, you know, some of the things are unbelievable. Like in Twelfth Night, you have a character who's, you know, twin twins. Uh, one of them, uh, the woman dresses up as a man and it's by, you know, believable by everybody and nobody questions it. And, um, you know, the, the adaptation movies kind of make fun of this a little bit because it is a little silly that people, although I think it's, you know, within the realm of possibility that with right makeup and, you know, things like that, you could do that. But, you know, it's still a kind of a. Well, it's more silly, the teen, you know, it's that early adolescent. It's the yeah. teenage boy. That's what he looks like. He, you know, he doesn't look like you. He's not an adult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, but in the, 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 the play is pretty simple. You have this character. Um, the, the way I, I see it is you have this island, Deliria, that is kind of in a stasis of love. That, that's what, one way I've um, been thinking about is you have the stasis of love where the Duke Orsino loves. We could talk about his love. I found his love very interesting. And I actually um, related to Duke Orsino in a very sad way. Um, but we could talk about that in a second. This is the famous line of the play opens. If music be the food yeah. of love, yeah, play it. on. So it's, it's a, it's a sad love that he has yeah. and that's what he's, he's getting into that. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about that, I'll just say like the thing for me is that he seems to love, love more than he actually loves Olivia, the, person. the countess. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what, and, and the fact that he just sn switches at the end is kind of, indicative of that to me is that well, there's he, a song from the mid 20th century called falling in love with love yeah and people still do that that happens oh, yeah. to people they're just so happy to be in love and then they realize but you know i don't really like this person as much as yeah <laughs> yeah which is a sad realization but it, i think it's very common and, and it's something that i think i you know as a lover of poetry i have to be careful not to apl apply that to a particular girl that i'm you know, if, if just like, oh, she kind of just embodies us a little bit or something like that. And I don't love her as a person. Um, and I think the, the Duke Orsino is a good example. And he's got some beautiful passages, like what you said at the beginning, 
you know, uh, uh, give me excess of that. Uh, surfeiting, the appetite may sicken and so die. You know, he has these types of uh, beautiful lines about the, this enjoyment of the music is love. And I'm just going to enjoy it until I die, basically, right? Well, I'll like, have so much. It'll be like overeating. I'll have yeah. so much sad music that it'll surf it. I'll have enough of it. It'll be okay. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in um, thinking about Shakespeare and Twelfth Night and, you know, our approach to it, whether you, um, you know, uh, agree with or, or want to take what Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff said and just like not read it, you know, one argument to try it. Because that wasn't what they were saying, by the way. I right. do not think that's right. what they were saying at all. Right. So I'm tr- trying to make an argument for why you should explore this so you could see a little bit more deeply what they were arguing. Is one thing is there are some universal truths that I, I see in this story, like the one I just said about the, you know, falling in love with love and not um, the Olivia problem. So that's Duke Orsino's problem. So you're saying Illyria, which is the island that the, that uh, Viola and Sebastian shipwreck on. So those are the two main characters or really Viola is the main character. She shipwrecks onto this island, Illyria. Illyria is in this, what I call what I, I've heard called a stasis of love. We have Duke Orsino in love with the countess, but the countess refuses to love or marry anybody because she is uh, mourning her brother, right? which is similar, by the way, to what Viola does when she gets there, I think, right? So there's almost like a, a deep spiritual connection, which is, a, is an interesting thing. But the thing that really captured me, and Anna, you know, because you're adapting this in Bollywood, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, especially how you're doing this. Is w- one of the things that I really understood about Viola, if I understand this correctly, is she is kind of a representation of repression in a sense, and because she's pretending to be a man, right? And so she's falling in love or fa- falls in love with Orsino almost at first sight, but she can't come out and say it, right? And not in clear terms, although it kind of, in the poetry, it kind of bubbles up sure. a little bit, like, you know, in, in weird ways that I, I might've underlined a couple sentences if I can find it, but, but it kind of bubbles up and like, you know, oh, you break my heart. Um, you know, when you say this and he's like, what, you know, stuff like that. And he's like, what are you talking about? And, you know, so I thought of it as like Viola really represents this kind of repressed love. And I don't know if I, what do you think about that? You think that's, I got it right. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, she has to repress it. Yeah. You see, so it's, it's just her circumstance. So whether you see that as sort of tragic or comic, uh, I don't know if she represents it so much mm. as, that's her dilemma is, you know, she can't just come out and be a woman who shipwrecked because that would be very dangerous way back when. But mm. I did want to mention the Bollywood thing. So I think yeah. that is a great trope to invite people in. When people hear, first of all, everybody wants to come back and be together, right? Yeah. So when they hear there's a Bollywood 12th night, then it's like, well, I don't know how they're going to do that. But I assume there's going to be music and dancing and it's going to be very joyful and it'll be very colorful. So it's a way to invite audience in, especially audiences who might not be so familiar with Twelfth Night. We did this play in a Bollywood inspired design oh, almost 10 years ago, but we did it outdoors hmm. in the park. Interesting. And okay. when you do things outdoors in the park, I just have to get really big and more generalized. This one, I think we can get more intimate and almost more cinematic because we're doing it in a small theater and the audience is going to be with us in that space. You know, it's not 500 people seeing it. It's 130 people seeing it. So we're really excited. We start rehearsal just next week. So we're really excited to do it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so tell me about the intimacy versus the grandiosity. That's an interesting perspective. So if I could just make one tip for people, because I sometimes get asked this question about reading classics. One, you know, don't overwhelm yourself. So my recommendation to people with someone, something like Shakespeare, if you're, you know, a computer engineer and you're not, you know, in the literary world much, I do highly recommend that you use your local theater as an, as an excuse to not just go to that play, but, you know, make it even a family exercise. Like, read the play ahead of time, 
watch some YouTube synopsis clips to understand it. Maybe even take a, you know, a small course that kind of tells you about it, watch a couple adaptations, and then, then go with, you know, kind of t- armed with some understanding so that when you go see Ann Chickalala's uh, Bollywood version of this, you can kind of evaluate and you can, you can, ex- or you can really just experience what they do because so much of it is about the space and, um, you know, about the space, the intimacy or the, the grandiosity. And then just the choices that the artistic director makes, right? Like, um, I'm very curious to see, I'm almost nervous to ask um, how you're going to portray Malvolio in the dungeon, in the darkness, because I've heard a couple of variations. Like there's one, uh, so Malvolio, which basically means ill will, is kind of this weird discordant character. Um, And so, and this kind of, I think, gets to the intimacy. So like with him, maybe we could talk about this. Um, Or you can switch it to something else if you prefer. But with him, when people play a trick on him by giving him a letter that makes him think that the Dutch or the yeah the the, um, Duchess the the Countess uh, Olivia is in love with him, and he reads that letter out right. He reads it out loud, and it's just him. And and you know, like I'm curious, like do you think that um, is better in the the this more intimate version or in the grand version or or how do you think about that? I think Shakespeare is so great at this sort of thing because he will make it really comic, but then he'll draw you into the reality of that character. Mm. So when the play ends, Malvolio leaves in anger and the audience, I think can really sympathize with him because the joke has gone too far. We've treated this person in a way that is cruel, but that's Shakespeare. I mean, that's sort of Shakespeare's brilliance, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I think of, you know, Ayn Rand and, and Leonard talking about Hamlet as, you know, setting up this guy who is too pensive, too, he thinks too much so he can't act. Yeah. He can't do the revenge play because it's a revenge play, right? Yep. And that's a really interesting aspect to seeing human beings who sometimes overly think what they're gonna do and don't do anything. Yeah. So I think Shakespeare has lots to say. Um, and you know, he's just the beginning of, you know, the God is not involved so much anymore. You know, if you think of sort of 1600 as the end of, of, uh, of Shakespeare, that's really That's the Hamlet, beginning right? of the Renaissance, yeah. Yeah. That um, you start to see things a little, a little differently. So uh, you know, I think sometimes we're too hard on Shakespeare because mm-hmm. it's going to take hundreds of years for yeah. Romanticism to happen, and also for the Industrial Revolution to happen, and so on. So he's just the beginning of really looking at individuals. So mm-hmm. I think he takes types and elevates them to a more uh, sympathetic level. So one way that I understood this was in a broad sense, um, and Shakespeare pre-1600. So one way that um, one person, that a lecturer I was listening to said to break up Shakespeare is there's 1600 is the midpoint. That's Hamlet. There's pre-1600, which is basically 12 years prior to that. And then there's basically 12 years post that. So Shakespeare was writing plays for about 24 years, a little bit, give or take. And so that's a good midway point. And you could see like Romeo and Juliet as a, um, you know, and, and if you saw the movie Shakespeare in Love, I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Did you like that movie? Yeah, I did. I, I like that movie. Yeah. Um, and it was in the movie. Now, I don't know historically, but it was originally thought of as possibly being a comedy when he was originally writing it, but then it ended up being a tragedy. And the main thing about a lot of his love stories, whether it's Romeo and Juliet or Measure for Measure or Twelfth Night, is there is something, or Midsummer's Night, Night Streamers, there's something called a block to love, right? So a block to love can be external or internal, right? And so in the pre-1600s um, with the Romeo and Juliet's, I think the Midsummer, that's pre-1600, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's an early, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that the block to love is like a father or a law like a law in Athens that you have to do this, or, or it's a father saying you can't be with the, you know, the Capulets and the Montagues can't be together, 
So there, there's this external thing that they have to kind of navigate and try to get through it. And then something happened in the second half of his career where the block to love was more internal. So with Orsino, it's like this desire within him for love and with, um, you know, that he wants love and he just wants love for the love's sake. You have this Malvolio, this, this counterpart to these things where he wants, he doesn't really seem to want love either. He wants status and power over others, um, which is made fun of. And he's kind of getting the reverse of all his desires. And then, uh, then of course, the Countess Olivia is repressed and she has this, or she's refusing to explore or uh, bring out her love for others to the degree where she does not allow others to, um, or she doesn't give her gift, I think is how it's kind of put, like her talents, I think is the one way they put it, which was thought of as like God's gift and you're supposed to give, this is what Viola does to get Olivia out. And the, to your point, what I'm, the, this whole rant I'm going on right now to uh, go on what you're saying, Anne, is that there, Shakespeare is exploring human nature in a new way that's different. So there is a kind of a th- like um, ancient Greek fatalism to his early plays, and it's even in the later plays, but I think he's playing with, well, maybe there is internal differences and, and explorations and people are trying, you know, they're, they're multifaceted and they have multiple values. So in a sense, there's almost like the, um, Ayn Rand called him the godfather of naturalism, which is probably true, but there might even be the glimmerings of a future romanticism. And he definitely well, you, had a big you and I, Kirk talked about Macbeth. Yes. And that would probably, we did an earlier show and that's probably a good example of fate is on Macbeth, but he is struggling and making decisions and his wife really gets him to make a bad decision that, you know, she encourages that and so on. So it's interesting to not just see it as fatalistic because yeah. if it's just fate, nobody, nobody's going to be interested. It, the drama is about the individual making decisions. Yeah, and how they deal with fate, right? And how they make that, even though, you know, Oedipus, we still watch and fascinate over today, even though that is like very fatalistic, right? Like it, it's, he's basically just enacting the prophecy word for word. But he's struggling. He he's trying. But he's struggling with it. Yeah. And it's his virtues in that case, in Oedipus uh, Colonus or Oedipus Rex, it's his virtues that actually propel him into this fate. You know, he's like a detective and his wife tells him to stop and he doesn't stop. She's like, wait a second. This is starting to sound very familiar. I don't like this. Stop. And he's like, no, because I need to know the truth in order to solve. Right. And so Viola, she in in Twelfth Night, she is the thing that I do like about her character. Uh, Although I'll be honest with my first reading, I didn't have a powerful reaction. But partly I think that's because I when I first read a story like a a Shakespeare play, I'm just trying to understand it. Sure. And I'm going to, sure. you know, it's the performance that I think I'll have the, you know, but I'll be ready for the performance because I have all mm-hmm. these ideas and mm-hmm. thoughts about it. But what I did like about Viola that I understood and I saw in the adaptations, like both adaptations got this, you know, she's the man, which is a very bad one. I mean, it's a good one. And uh, one of the guys I think is a, just terribly done, but is Viola has almost a magic power to open people to love. And she, bring, you know, in the, the, in Viola in Twelfth Night, she opens up the kind of, you know, Olivia, like I said, by bring. of course, the, the love is transferred to Cesario or uh, uh, Viola, who's playing Cesario, a man. And she does the same thing with Orsino, in a sense, bringing him out of his, in, his desire for love. But into I think you can see story. both in the movie parody and in Shakespeare's play that it is her very femaleness. Mm-hmm. That yep. gets people to feel their yeah. feelings, yeah, and identifies their feelings. So yeah. that's just something to to think about. Even though we know Shakespeare had guys play, you know, the, yeah. the roles of women because that's the way they had to do it at that time, and so on. But uh, cool. Well, and a lot of um, you know, unfortunately, if you read about Shakespeare, it can be confusing because a lot of critics spend a, too much time focused like on this play, for instance, I read a lot of criticism and that's what they focused on a lot was the fact that a male 
was playing this. I see. Double, so they got like philosophical about, oh, it was a male playing, a, which it can be a little confusing, I think, sure, to, sure. to their point. But um, there's so much to this play. You know, whether you're in Austin or not, I hope you take the opportunity to read it, you know, to, um, by the way, I'll just have to make a plug. I really love my Norton and Shakespeare that I, I, I saw if, that online. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to make a plug. Leonard plugs this guy called A.L. Rouse, R-O-W-S-E, because okay. he has updated some of the language. But the oh. truth is, I think he only got through four or five plays. Oh, I mean, and they're out of print and I have them, you know, some are in paperback. But uh, that's wonderful. And we at Austin Shakespeare, oftentimes, if a word is really archaic, we'll mm. either cut it or, or update it. But go ahead. You were saying Matt Norton. No, no, that's great. I think like, um, you know, my recommendation for those who are intimidated by Shakespeare is to use some of the study guides to look at it as you know, and, and this may not be the most fun thing, but at the first time, the way I do it is I look at it as like, I'm just reading to try to understand the basics of it this first time. And then I'm going to watch performances and understand it. And then I'll have a better approach to it. And that, you know, I really strongly recommend because the pleasure of finally getting there is, is like the pleasure of climbing a high mountain and you're exhausted. It's tiring, but it feels, you know, otherworldly. It's amazing. Yeah. It's I use the parallel of opera. I mean, I think if you just become familiar with a few major arias, a few major duets, and and go to see an opera, then it's you've got something to hang on to. You yeah. know, it's not like it's all a wash. So, but you have such a great attitude, Kirk, toward delving into the classics. Yeah, I mean, I think it's well, one. One, one negative thing is that sometimes I'll watch like movies today. I'm like, this is just a really bad example. You know, like, so like you, you get these plots and you understand them more. And, um, you know, sometimes it can kind of ruin because you see like the same thing over and over again. And it's just like, I want something new now. Give me something better. But to me, that's like being able, you know, like you're an athlete in a sense. And now it's like, oh, I want a bigger mountain. I want a big, you know, like, which I think is part of the self-growth as a human. Uh, that all of us should move toward. And, you know, but with Shakespeare, I mean, this thing is so accurate in some, in, 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 to me in certain ways. Like, maybe we can close with this because we're at, um, or, you know, this, and if you have any final thoughts, we'll do one more thing. But one general fun thing about Twelfth Night, and I think some of his romantic things, but we may not think in our generation, you know, I'm 36, you you may think that when you date, you don't have formal trends and, and behaviors of what you're supposed to do. Like we think about the 50s or the early 1900s, like, oh, they had these weird behaviors. You had to have a chaperone and have the, and you may think that you don't have that, but you do. And um, what's fun about this play is if you can understand, so I had to look up some of these, but if you can understand the early 17th century courting rituals, then you, this play, I think, even opens up even more on another level because it's very similar to the weird stuff that we do. Um, you know, I think today the thing that couples or like when they're first starting to date, it seems like <laughs> um, one thing they might do is like actually wax, philos or wax psychological about their own psychologies. And it's like, so they're, they're talking about their needs and desire, like in this, like that's a, especially if you're a college educated person, that's what, I think college students do more in their dating rituals at the beginning, or like, you know, there's this weird group dating dynamic today that wasn't even there when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, right? Like to me trying to, you know, as a single guy trying to date now, it's like, can't I just like pick you up? Like, <laughs> you know, and, and we go on like to a dinner, like a normal person. Why do we have to go to, you know, meet together for 10 months with friends and then go, you know, and, and there's just all these weird things and the same types of things are happening in 12th night. Just 17th century style, you know, 1600 style. So, cool. Well, I do want to say again, take a look at Leonard's uh, great plays. Uh, and it was great to be able to just go back to the Romantic Manifesto and uh, look at some of the things that Rand has written about, about art and its integrating value and how everybody needs art. And yeah. uh, so I thank you for this opportunity and for ARUK. Yay. Yes, thank you. And we're going to be on Clubhouse. So if you have questions, you know, about either Ayn Rand's view of art 
Leonard Picasso's Eight Great Plays or Shakespeare or any of those things. Um, Anne and I will go and, um, you know, hang out on Clubhouse for a good 30 minutes or so and would love to talk with you guys. So, yeah, thank cool. you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Mary Lean. We're glad yeah. you're here. All right. Thank you, everybody. So that's a show. And we're going to sign off now and go over to um, Clubhouse. We'll see you there. Thank okay. you.